Neuroplasticity can be divided into two parts. Neuro, the first part of the word, and plasticity. Plasticity. Neuro refers to the brain. Plasticity refers to the Greek word plasticos or mold. Mold in the sense of shaping. It is literally the shaping or molding of your brain. Neuroplasticity is involved anytime we are uh, experiencing a new experience, we are learning new material. An example being like learning how to ride a bike. We are rehearsing lines to memorize something. Neuroplasticity is occurring in our brains. There are two kinds of neuroplasticity. We have structural neuroplasticity. Structural. And we have functional neuroplasticity. Structural neuroplasticity refers to our brain actually physically growing or shrinking in response to experiences uh, and learning. An example being your amygdala. Uh, if you experience stress over and over again, you can have an overdeveloped amygdala. This would be the amygdala being a portion of your brain that is responsible for your stress. We also have functional plasticity. Functional plasticity refers to parts of your brain picking up slack that other parts uh, may no longer be doing, let's say because of disease, an example being dementia. We'll get into that later. Three mechanisms by which neuroplasticity works. We have neurogenesis, or the development of neurons or brain cells in your body. Synaptogenesis, the development of synapses or connections between those neurons in the body. And then we have angiogenesis, or the development of blood vessels within your body. Angiogenesis. Blood vessels are really important for parts of your brain that get used uh, over a large amount of time that require a lot of nutrients, require a lot of work, that are doing a lot of work, and therefore blood vessels are needed to supply them. The common misconception that our brains stop producing neurons uh, after childhood, and that is fundamentally not true. Just because we experience less neuroplasticity as adults than children, we still do experience neuroplasticity. Two examples I like to talk about are mirror therapy, mirror therapy, and mindfulness. Mindfulness. A trend you may have heard of. Mirror therapy is used to treat phantom pain. And phantom pain is caused when I am missing a limb. Let's say, for example, my left hand is there. I lost my left hand. People that experience phantom pain may still feel as if their left hand is present. They may feel an itching, or weird sensations in their left hand, even though it's not there. And in extreme cases, they'll feel pain. Now, how do you treat itch? How do you treat a pain where your left hand isn't present? Well, we use what's called mirror therapy. And the way mirror therapy works is we create a mirror, right? And we show our right hand in the mirror, and that makes it look like my left hand is present. Because it looks like my left hand is present, I can itch my right hand, and my brain sees my left hand being itched. And now we think that phantom pain is caused because although we don't have nerves in our left hand, because it's gone, the portion of the brain responsible for our left hand is still there. And so, that disconnect, that almost maladaptive neuroplasticity, is what causes you to feel that phantom pain. By seeing the reflection of my right hand, my, what looks like my left hand, by seeing that reflection and being able to itch it, it tricks our brain into thinking that we're actually itching our left hand, and by doing so, we remove the phantom pain. Another example of neuroplasticity in adults is mindfulness. Mindfulness is focusing on the right now. It's not thinking about the exam you have next week. It's not focusing on the embarrassing thing you did yesterday. Mindfulness is all about paying attention to the moment. The practice has been known to reduce anxiety, depression, and has been used in therapies to treat personality dis disorders like borderline personality disorder, BPD. Mindfulness has been known in studies to actually reduce 
overdeveloped portions of your brain that may be caused from a fear response. As we talked earlier, with structural plasticity, portions of your brain may develop due to experience, overdevelop, underdevelop due to experiences and learning. In those with anxiety and depression, there is a link to an overdeveloped amygdala. The amygdala being a region of your brain that's responsible for fear and stress. Those with overdeveloped amygdalas that practice mindfulness, there has been shown data that mindfulness has lowered the, the size of your amygdala over time, reducing that stress, that fear response, and being a perfect example for neuroplasticity. While children's brains are more neuroplastic than adults, neuroplasticity still occurs in adults. With that said, neuroplasti neuroplasticity is incredibly strong in children, to the point where they can have their entire right hemisphere removed and still undergo a normal life. This example that I'm referring to occurred in 2010, where a nine-year-old girl uh, was having seizures every few minutes. And as a result, doctors removed her right hemisphere and the girl was still able to function with a normal life a few weeks after with only minor symptoms such as a loss of her, uh, certain aspects of her peripheral vision. So we've talked about neuroplasticity being more common in children than adults, but we don't know why that is the case. One hypothesis is called your critical period hypothesis. Critical period hypothesis. Critical period hypothesis explains that as children, we are exposed to huge swaths of information and, and a boatload of experiences. In doing so, we have to learn very quickly. Over time, humans have adapted to, during critical periods, during certain times within our childhood, be able to take in a huge amount of information and process. For that reason, we have really high neuroplasticity for those moments, for those experiences. Now. Again, this is a hypothesis. We don't know for certain, but it, it's one of the leading theories currently for why neuroplasticity is so high in children. So currently, we know there's a correlation between neuroplasticity and dementia. I'm just saying there's a correlation. In no way does that mean neuroplasticity causes dementia or vice versa, but we do know that a decrease in neuroplasticity, decrease in neuroplasticity is linked to an onset of dementia symptoms. Dementia symptoms. And this leads us into our second uh, key term for this topic, which is cognitive, cognitive reserve. Now, there is a hypothetical concept called cognitive reserve, and that is almost like our tenacity to resist dementia symptoms, right? And that's involved in neuroplasticity. We have passive cognitive reserve and active cognitive reserve. Passive cognitive reserve refers to the fact that denser brains, high density brains, expose that that are that have dementia symptoms. If they have more synapses, if they have a higher density, are more resistant to showing dementia symptoms. It may take. They almost have a buffer before showing dementia symptoms. Active cognitive reserve refers to what we talked about earlier with functional plasticity. Let's say you have damage in your occipital lobe caused by dementia. It's how well can other parts of your brain pick up that function. Those that have higher active cognitive reserve compared to others are less likely to show dementia symptoms. Well, now there are efforts to increase cognitive reserve, increase neuroplasticity, through the use of uh, games, puzzles, and riddles. And in doing so, increase that passive reserve, increase that brain density, increase those synapses. Now that's still being studied, we don't know yet, but the hope is by employing games, puzzles, riddles, by engaging the brain, by causing an increase in cognitive reserve, we can delay dementia symptoms or even prevent it entirely. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you again soon.